Hey listeners, if you like this podcast, check out our other shows, The Study Table and Training Table. Listen to archived content and in-depth interviews with insiders working with student athletes. It's on our website, www.fredopi.com. Welcome to The Dinner Table, a discussion with food as a lens into cultures and societies. I'm your host, Fred Opie. In October of 2011, I made my way to the epicenter of the Occupy Wall Street movement to speak to members of what they call the People's Kitchen. What you're about to hear is a number of interviews I did as part of my larger series called Feed in the Revolution the role of food in social movements. The People's Kitchen didn't just emerge out of nowhere, but it's part of an earlier movement known as the Rainbow Gatherings. The Rainbow Gatherings has a long history and we'll learn more about it as we go along. On this journey, you'll meet people who came to Occupy Wall Street from New Jersey, Wisconsin, San Francisco, and other parts of the United States. Napoleon said that an army marches on its stomach what we learn is that the army marches on its stomach as the people make the food. As I walked around Occupy Wall Street on this windy and cold day in October and saw Michael, I was surprised to find that he had a British accent. Michael? Michael, where are you from? Originally from England, in the United States for 40 years. And how long have you been down at Occupy Wall Street? I just got here. Just today? So, so what do you think? Uh, you, you've seen other movements like this? Absolutely. And what role do you see food playing in social movements? It's the core of it, just like in life. I mean, that's where it all begins. It's good nutrition, good food. And would you say that the kitchen here is, have you ever seen a, you know, like a movement? As... Kitchen like this? Yeah. I, I learned to cook at a thing called Rainbow Gatherings. What was that? Rainbow Gathering is an alternative 4th of July. It started after the Woodstock Festival and the hippies chose a place in the National Forest to gather every July, the 4th, to pray for peace. And you work at a kitchen like this? And it's kitchens like this. Every, all the food is donated, all the labor is donated, and everything is works on gift economy. And we fed thousands of people. We cooked outdoors on wood fire. And that this is something that is still happening every year. It's so you fabulous. see similar things here? I heard a little rumor that some of the people that got this going at the first were people from Rainbow Gathering because we all have experience in organizing this kind of camp kitchen to feed lots of people, stay clean, keep people. So some of these people have much older roots and they're bringing that history here. So this the is not something new, you're thinking? No, no. What you see here is lots of young people like this and they're occupying the park and thank goodness they are. Some of them are working, but you can see a lot of hanging out and talking and ranting. The people who are keeping this running are people, well, I'm 70, I'm older than most, but it's people 40, 50, 60, 70, with some young people who have the know-how, have the experience, have got the sort of, you know, the, the strength and the serenity to hold it together with all the stress, and it's to assert the people's right of free assembly. How old were you when you did your first move? I was a college student, so I was about 19, University of London, Aldermaston, Peace March, Bertrand Russell, the English Peace Movement, that's what And then I got into anti-nuclear organizing when I came that's here. Right. Yeah, the kitchens at Seabrook, nuclear power plant they wanted to build up in, uh, in New Hampshire, where there was no, you know, if anything happened to it, there was no way for a couple of million people to escape. And we went in, we tried to stop it being constructed. Oh yeah, we had a big kitchen there. Same thing, food donated by other yeah, organizations? Yeah. I was here last night, and crowd smaller, no media. Now it's warm, daytime, and all these so-called celebrities coming out to be seen at Occupy Wall Street to get attention. The thing is, we're, we're saying the, re the revolution will not be televised. Yesterday I see this guy, they're doing a model shoot in the middle of this, but this is the backdrop. We're the happening thing this time. You're branding, you come here to brand. It's not, it's not just them, 
you've got all the, the revolutionary communist party, the socialist world. The, the body snatchers, that's what I call <laughs> They're here recruiting. Every issue, they jump on it. Oh, and you've got us sort of, what is it? It's a mix of anarchists and peace movement people. Do you have people on the right, you know, and, you know Tea Party type of people? Mm -hmm. Because they were against the bailout too. I think the people, the progressives missed the boat. Way back to Reagan times, yeah. right then, that we missed the boat. Reagan got all the bubbers yeah. to vote for most of the stuff that led to this crap. Uh -huh. And it's because we didn't talk, yeah, the white working class, there wasn't unity between black and white working people. And we let the right, and the right wing knew to go and go and recruit those people. They knew exactly who they were after. Uh -huh. And they worked through the churches and the social clubs. Learning from Michael about Rainbow Movement, I wanted to find out more about it. So I was able to talk to Amy, who, according to many in the People's Kitchen, was at the genesis of what was going on at Occupy Wall Street in terms of food. Amy Dawn Hamburger. Where are you from? Queens Village, New York. I was working as a substitute paraprofessional, at which point I came down here and I stopped going there. How long have you been here? When did you, you remember? Since when you, day one. So, oh, wow. September 17th. So did you have like a food background before you joined the kitchen committee? I worked as a waitress for six years. Oh, okay. Um, I also find that I'm about service and a lot of people who are about service tend to gravitate towards food. Okay. I've, I've visited a lot of communities where I've done a lot of things in the kitchen. Is this your first social movement? Yes. I mean, my life, it did seem like it was naturally tending here because for the past few years I've been traveling, visiting communities, communes, going to rainbow gatherings. Some of what you guys do is kind of predicated on that history of that movement? A lot of, the way I set up the kitchen and the way of, a lot of the stuff I have contributed is led directly or modified from rainbow gatherings. So have you been going to rainbow gatherings for a couple of years or so? Yeah. So, so, this, so. Is, this is basically the child of protests and rainbow gatherings. Someone coined the term, and it's a joke term, but protestable because it's a combination of protest and festival. What role do you see food playing in a social movement? I'm going to address directly the rainbow experience for a moment because that's where my history is, like where my teaching, like my learning is from. Um, it was everything for me because you go there and you learn about giving and about service and the way to plug in, a way to become a part of the community there is to plug into one of the kitchen and just go and be like, what do you need? What do you help? And there's just a whole culture of service based around the food. The food is free and the community comes together and prepares it. And usually there's um, a group circle and one of the camps will serve the food. So it's, it's, it's about family, it's about togetherness, and it's about self and service. But how many people would attend a, a rainbow event? If it were nationals, it's tens of thousands. I'm not sure. So there are regional and there's a national. Yeah. And Regionals you, are much smaller, from okay. 100 to 1,000. 100 to 1,000. And then the other one you say could be as much as 10,000. Could be more. Have you, have you been to a national? They have been to a national. So in a national, you must have several kitchens then. This is what it is, and it might be part of a solution to a problem we're having here, um, is there's different families and there's different camps. So there's a, a New England kitchen, and there's the kitchen that believes in this, and then there's the the street kids kitchen. There's different names for them. So they get together and there's a kitchen that just cooks pancakes. Okay. So it's many communities within the larger community. Very, very interesting stuff. So you, it, food is food is everything when it comes to that. Is this, is this a good template of what you've learned, of what you saw? Or are, you, have you done some different things here compared well, there, to that? There are definite different things because of the nature of this as opposed to rainbow gathering. A rainbow gathering is in the woods. A Does that make it easier or harder? Different. Okay. Different. I mean, okay. we have resources here that we would not have there, and there's resources there that we would not have there. For instance, there'd be running water there of some kind that you can filter. We don't have that. But we also have stores and people donating food and plenty of food and resources that we do not have in the woods. So it's, it's adapting that. I'm going to give you a little history directly. Good. The first few days were very, very rough. Like, there, as now, there's Organization was an issue. We kept getting like all this dumpster bread, and there was an issue. We were concerned about the health inspector, and there's all this stuff around. So I ended up staying up all night organizing and laying out a tablecloth. And one of the things I did was to try to make it more like home. I started writing signs out, and one of the signs that is very much like a rainbow idea was um, if you see something that needs to be done, do it. Okay. And I kind of feel that's what's behind the movement. Okay. From that, I ended up getting a lot of volunteers. What's now been built is I kind of started to learn how to empower people, and those people kind of learned how to empower. And we have a core group of like at least 20 people in the kitchen right now. 
now that are empowered to act and don't feel like anyone's leading them and work together. And that hopefully that will grow because even now we're overworked. Well, Amy, would you say that you are the brains of the operation? I would say I gave birth. But at this point, it's, I'm just as much a player as anyone else. It's its own organism and it should have a life of its own that I'm still a part. I like kind of nurture the kitchen. What happened was the first day I came here, they said split into work. They, one of them was food. I said, no, I'm not going to go to food. I always go to food. I'm not doing food. Okay. I went and walked towards that wall where arts and culture was going to be. And I'm like, finally, I'm honoring my artists. I'm going to go to arts. That's just your background kind of artist? I mean, I'm, I'm an actress. Okay. Third day. What were your numbers like that first day? Not more than 100. What I learned at Rainbow Gathering is basically in order to be part of the community, you have to work and you have to give of yourself in order to get back. The one person, there was one person who was running the kids. Chris, one person, and basically it was a pyramid of peanut butter jars and a bag of dumpster bagels. So I asked him, can I help you make peanut butter and jelly? And he said, of course. So I helped him. And it wasn't peanut butter and jelly, it was peanut butter. Later we got jelly. So I was making the peanut butter sandwiches and I helped him for an hour or two and I walked away. That night I came up to him and of course, like a lot of people, he wasn't getting any sleep. He had to, he lived in the area. He's like, I, I need to go home and get sleep. I trust you, will you watch the kitchen? And I said, okay. And I felt honored. I was like, all right. <laughs> and so I did. And basically from there, that was it. Because it's, there's so many things to take care of. Like I didn't sleep that night, I don't think. Um, the next night was probably the night that I was up 24 hours cleaning the kitchen. It was all me and I was supposed to know everything. Say it was part of a bench with a, a pyramid of peanut butter, and peanut butter and jelly. And I heard somebody say that you guys are literally getting pizzas sent from everywhere. Who set that up? Justin, who did it through Twitter. It was around the same, t the night that I stayed for the first time and I was asked to do the kitchen, that's when the Liberatos thing started getting really big. Justin Twittered, send us pizza. And I guess he found this Liberatos and it just, it worked and people kept getting pizza and now they have like an amazing business from us. How do you keep from getting burnt out? I hear all the hours you're pulling. You're learning. Right now I'm setting up um, a program where I'm bringing in like teachers and leaders to um, help us how to sustain ourselves. Tonight we're having a meeting which I'm calling Sustaining the Occupiers which is going to kind of let all the people that have been here for a month vent and talk about how they've been feeling. So we'll see. We're learning. Amy sure provided a lot of context of how these people were able to pull this off. One of the most interesting fellows I came upon next was Chris, who made his way to Occupy Wall Street after hiking on the Appalachian Trail. Chris, how long have you been here? Just about a week. I was hiking on the Appalachian Trail. And every time I went out to resupply, I heard it got bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where I said, I got to go do some urban camping. I grew up in Englewood, New Jersey, but I live in Seattle the last 25 years. You and heard this on the trail. I come out to resupply, and I, I'm a news junkie, so I find out the news. And first it was, a bunch of people are doing it. Interesting. Then it was 700 people arrested on the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm like, damn, I don't want to go to Rikers. Right. But they're brave. And then it started growing. And I said, well, maybe I need to backstop the people who, are, went, who got arrested. And here I am. I didn't want to. I felt like I had to. Okay. Because, that, yeah. because, you know, I was up for the draft in the Vietnam War. You know? I mean, well, I wasn't up. The war ended in 74 and I turned 18 in 74. Okay. But they ended the draft in 72. Okay. But I didn't know that in 70. So I had been protesting because okay. I saw it coming. So, you know? so this, is, this is not your, your first social movement? Oh, no. And then there was the war movement, the anti-nuke movement, the civil rights movement. I grew, up, yep. I grew up during all of those. Okay. So all those movements were my movements. Yeah. Do you see this one any different? Have you ever known anything about global this fan? Well, oh. it's because of the internet and, and the, the ability to network. We didn't have that back then. Uh -huh. In fact, I was hiking on the Appalachian Trail. Guys are hiking with Kindles Thank and, you. and iPhones. The heart of this thing... Is the, is the kitchen. Lots of people come by and, the, and they're impressed that how we're the, the, dances, how we're feeding all these people. Yeah. Chris provided an interesting context to how people were finding out about Occupy Wall Street and people who came from a long history of civil disobedience and protest. Next, I met Beth, who came to Occupy Wall Street via San Francisco. She helped provide a sense of how a similar movement was going on on the West Coast. What, what, what's your name? Beth. Where are you from? I actually live in San Francisco. Okay. 
And you were at Occupy San Francisco for how long? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two is the kitchen long. in San Francisco as big as this one? No, San Francisco is much smaller. Okay. Um, and we had a, a stove. Did you volunteer in that food committee in San Francisco? No, I wasn't on the food committee. Okay. I too involved in other stuff. Yeah. But, um, they, um, when we first started, we had tents and there was a, a kitchen tent and they did have a stove that they were cooking on site. The police came in, told them they had to take down their tents. There was a raid a few weeks ago that I was at on a Wednesday night where they had like 75 police officers in riot gear come and like walk wow. through the camp and look menacing. Okay. And they dumped a lot of our possessions. A lot of what they threw out were the food donations. Oh, wow. And so we basically had a rent, well, a lot of it got thrown out in the truck, and then they said you could come back and get your stuff three days later, but obviously food was ruined, and so we lost a lot of food, and we had to start um, having, um, just telling people, bring food that's already prepared. Okay. As far as I know, there's not a formalized off-site system, so okay. people are just bringing food. Sometimes it's prepared food that they're preparing on their own and bringing, but it has to be used. It has to be something that people can eat right away because okay. we can't store it because of the storage issue. What what role do you see food playing in, in a movement like this? Food is a big part of it because when people are camping out um, and they're not, you know, if they're making it they're basically their full-time job to join this protest movement, it's vital to have food available. So um, the fact that people are stepping up there and here, bringing food every single day, bringing food donations, people who maybe are working people and can't, you know, camp out every night or they're older or, or have children, um, they're contributing by bringing food and making sure people have food available. And it is, uh, I think, vital to, you know, being able to maintain this movement. Food is, is probably just as vital as money contributions. Because even when you get money contributions, there's all kinds of logistical issues that come into play when you have a non-hierarchical, you know, direct democracy system um, that I've seen there and here about, you know, who's in charge of the money, how do you access the money, what are the rules regarding the money. So bringing food is probably actually an even more direct way to help the movement, I think. We'll be right back. For more interviews and related content, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and other podcast distributors. Also, check out our website at www.fredopi.com. Ask questions on Facebook at Frederick Douglass Opie and on Twitter at Dr. Fred D. Opie. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. Hey listeners, if you're enjoying this episode, check out the show entitled From Black Panthers to Black Lives Matter. It's available on the Dinner Table show page. Although we, we seek to deconstruct racism, institutional racism, there is no particular set of ways that the party seeks or the, the movement seeks to do that. And I think that one of the reasons is it, it's leadership. It's all decentralized. There, there isn't a hierarchy within the movement. Whereas for the, the Black Panther Party, there was certainly a hierarchy. Women played a significant role. Now in the Black Lives Matter movement, queer women are playing an even greater role and are out about who they are and what they are. Now back to the show. Next, I met Bo, who came to Occupy Wall Street from Wisconsin which had been embroiled in its own conflict as the governor of the state, Scott Walker, faced off against organized labor. Tell me your full name. Uh, Bo Sibbing. Where are you from, Bo? Uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And how long have you been here? About three weeks now. And you're a member of which committee? Uh, kitchen, People's Kitchen. The food that you guys have, where does it come from? It's, it's mostly donations. Um, actually, a really big contributor to us happens to be the uh, Correctional Officers Union. We, we also get donations uh, from some churches. I know Judson Church is helping us out a lot. Oh, okay. It's over by Washington Square. What kind of things are you getting, for example, from the Corrections Union? The Corrections Union are, are helping us out. They're, they've given us a um, hunk of money. We get, we get uh, $500 a week, I believe. 
Uh, we're gonna go to Costco. They, they hook us up with Here's Costco the cards. They provide the driving. Even they pick us up, take us over to Costco. Make sure if we need supplies because a lot of things that we get mostly food, obviously. Um, but we need like plates and you know, napkins, uh, gloves, you know, things like that. Supplies that we need that aren't food that we can go and get at Costco. The kitchen's open all the time, or how's it run? That shift we pretty much run in three shifts. We run from seven to seven to noon, okay. and then uh, noon to five, and then we take a break from five until seven when dinner starts. But we try to do a hard close at eleven. But most of the time we still have a bunch of granola bars, stuff like that. And you eat we what just, we give you. We just kind of put out and let people take for themselves after we okay. pull the clothes. Where are you guys cooking at? We do have off-site cooking. Um, we have a place. Um, th there's a place in uh, East New York. We also have a place um, in Brooklyn that we go to to cook off-site. Mornings, we, get, we just get it pretty catered. Next, I talked to Megan, who came from Queens to the Manhattan location of Occupy Wall Street. She explains what motivated her to get involved. Megan, tell me your full name. Megan Hayes. And where are you from? Queens. When did you first come? Uh, September 30th. I answer some of the uh, Occupy emails, uh -huh. and a lot of people have been quoting Napoleon, saying really? that uh, the army uh, marched on its stomach. That's been motivating them to give us more food donations. Is this your first social movement? Um, yeah. I've been, I guess I could finish, I've been sheltered. Were you, were you? I've been political, um, but never to the extent like this. So what did it? What pushed you to come? I, I started reading stories of people saying they had to choose between going to the doctor or putting food on the table or paying their mortgage and, um, or, you know, get, feeding their kids or getting, like, heating their house with oil. Like, they had to make choices for basic possessions that every human deserves. One thing that gets my goat is knowing that 2,000 calories worth of junk food is cheaper than 2,000 calories worth of healthy food. And how many inner city people can't afford healthy food? And because of that, they're overweight, they're diabetic, they are, you know, hyperglycemic. Hyperglycemic, exactly. They have high blood pressure, they have heart disease. Every healthy food should be a right. After walking around Occupy Wall Street for two days and doing interviews, it became quite evident to me that there was a lack of diversity and very little African American participation in the movement. I had the chance to talk to the self-proclaimed Brooklyn kid, and he gave his take on why African Americans are not involved from his neighborhood. A few people ask me, and I tell them, I'm down at Occupy Wall Street because you know what? I believe in change. And do they know what that is when you say that? Or are they like, what's that? A few people don't. It's just, you know, with the news says it is, a bunch of privileged kids, college graduates, you know, looking to start trouble and actually free things and get their college debt erased. So, so mean, even even that stereotype is is, is pervasive with the black community. Yes, it's very. They're, they're eating up the media. Eating up the media because, sad to say, but our communities are so entwined with television, culture. TV culture. Yeah. I mean, I listen to a radio station, ninety eight point seven, Reverend Al Sharpton, Kiss FM. He has a, a, a hour of power that comes on every Sunday night. One night I heard him talking about the the respect that these kids should have for. For, for holding on so long and dealing with this. And he's telling black people that we need to get in this. Okay. And, and the reason why, though, I, sometimes I disagree with his tactics, yeah. I respect them and I, and, I, and I believe in them, is because of the fact that he's doing it. You can't, you, can't, you can't say something doesn't work if you don't put your feet to the ground. Mm -hmm. You can't say something isn't good if you don't go check it out. That's like a, a book. You can't say it's not good if you don't go to the library and read it. You can't say there's no information if you're not trying to, to assert yourself in the world. So, so, I mean, so do you have the BLSs, the KISS FM? Do you have the yeah. Amsterdam News? Are they talking about this? As far as the, the black media goes, yeah. because the black media should be all over this. Yeah. In the sense that, you know what, they're saying 99%, and you can go in any most urban black communities, and 100% of us, I don't care what job you have, somehow... And some type of debt, some type of problem financially, out of work, some type of community issues where education is affecting our kids, or health issues where we don't have enough people with health insurance. So the black people should be in full force just like the rest of the world. However, you know, there's a lot of stigma to protesting and activism. It's an I care type thing. And the black people, we're too cool for school. Not to, not to generalize and say all black people are like that. Some are just genuinely scared. Some don't know. So, you know, that's why I'm here. Get information. Now, how did you find out about it? 
um, through the news. Okay. But I don't. Yeah. But I'm not too much of a believer what they put in news. Well, you say you are sw- you are swallow the Kool Aid. Uh, especially, especially if I ain't make it. You know, especially if I ain't make it. I got I got to do a little bit digging. You know, I'm not I'm not a, a historian, but yeah. I know a little bit. Yeah. Are you trying to bring the message? of what's going on here back to the communities. I don't think I'm strong enough okay. in the sense of what I know of the movement. Okay. Because I can say, yeah, we're fighting Wall Street and we're doing this and we're doing that, but the question is, why should I? But how does that help me? And then yeah. it'd be a back and forth. And I want to say concrete answers. Statistics, not really, but answers that when they're said, they're powerful. Have you gotten a sense of some, if you just said three clear demands from the group, from the General Assembly, can you walk away even with saying, this is what they want. My perception yeah. and what I've come from is they just want to change the way government deals with people. Okay. They want to change the way people deal with people, which okay. is very important. They know they don't speak about that much, but that's also one can, of the Can you elaborate on that point? They want to change how people deal with people. And, uh, and even, like you said, if you have here among this group, Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, you, you know, just demonizing the opponent, that stuff's got to stop. And, and if that can come out of here, and that could be heard by the powers that be, oh my gosh, that would change that would change American society radically. I think that's what Martin Luther King did in his own way. Like yeah. he said, I'm for the American government. Yeah. We want to be a part of this country. We are here. This yeah. is our home too. Yeah. But if we got to sleep in the basement, and you're not yeah. trying to clean out the basement, yeah. I'm moving up to the first floor. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I mean, this is it's a beautiful thing in its essence. But all things have to grow, and the way this is growing, you know. Who knows, who knows what it can be? We hear from Jabrell from Do or Die Bedside. Jabrell keeps it real with his perspective on Occupy Wall Street as an African-American male in his early 50s. What's your name? My name is Jabrell Muhammad. I live in Bedford Stuyvesant. So, because I'm looking at who's coming down here, right? Now, I was shocked when I seen Alex Bowman come. That's the first thing I walked by. Because what I actually did, brother, I stood across that street and this was her. It's peeping it. Those people. Then I want to see us who was it. So I, I want to see is that really my brother, right? Or is it one of my brothers who know how to work it? Yeah. But at the end of the day, I know where I came from. Because I that's why I came in here to like look around. So this morning, I got up and close. I said, let me go in the circle now. It, it's a lot of things in here that caught my eye. What do you think about the food kitchen? Looking to roll the food and social movements that. Way that's got to work. We got to have some food. You know, the kitchen, that's going to work, brother. I've been homeless. Yeah. I don't have a job now. Yeah. Right? What I'm really want to do on a full-time basis, and God bless me, to feed some children and seven days a week to let them know that somebody like yourself is successful, and that because we come out of some of the Russia's neighborhoods that we can make it. Yeah. What's happening is we don't got that no more. The young brother only sees, you know, Saquon. Yeah. That's all they see. Yeah. Why a soup kitchen? Because sometimes when you're feeding the mind, you can talk to people. Okay. I've been out network all the while. Okay. Operation Bed Basket back in the days, brother. You talk to a man, especially when he's starving, they know how to rap. They had them all in the hood back back there, bro. They had them in, in Hempstead, New York, in the black suburb. So you're saying when you feed them, they're going to be more you open can, to be able to talk some them. sense to them? Yeah, you can get some bottles right now. And you shot down some hardcore, brother. You sat down and you ate with them. Got them some real good food. And you can get some deep intel out of them. And they won't rob your way. <laughs> <laughs> we said you don't rob nobody to feed you? <laughs> they feed you, man. I'm going to end this segment with an interview with Thomas, a young man from Florida who decided to chronicle the work of the People's Kitchen, creating a manual that he hoped to disperse to other similar movements around the country and the world. Tell me your name. My name is Thomas Plessis. Where are you from? I am from Tampa, Florida. And how long have you been here? I've been here for uh, a little over 20 days. I'm actually working on a, a manual, like a handbook on what we've been doing here okay. that people can add to and people can uh, manipulate okay. for their own cities and their own occupations. Are going to put it online? We're going to do a PDF and we're also going to do a hard copy. The opening chapter of the living uh, handbook for uh, organizing a working group in the occupied locales is entitled The Importance of Food and Social Move. In our current system, leading empires control and waste most of the world's resources, while the dependent countries, or third world countries as we call them, 
str struggle with famine and malnutrition as, this, as these atrocities run rampant. Food is a right, not a privilege. Free food and access and empowerment towards sustainable movements and communities is the heart of the changes for an increasingly populated planet and its people. Food is freedom, and sustainability empowers the people of this earth to be rid of any force that would seek to enslave, control, or intimidate them into a life of poverty so that a small few can grow fat off of the blood of innocent, hardworking people. I know the way you guys structure everything is kind of consensus politics, how you do things. Right, right, a little decentralized. With the food committee, when you get down to the local level, do you meet? When do you guys like get we together and decide what you're going to do? organizational meetings that are open to anybody who wants to help in the kitchen hours throughout the day like we have okay. one at 11 we have one we're gonna start having one at 5 15. so tell me some of the if you some of the challenges we're trying to feed a revolution what, what are some of the things you deal with it's just kind of hard to keep things somewhat organized but we're doing it um this is the first big thing i've ever i've never seen anything like this is a movement like this can't work without it food. can't it can't last without a heart <laughs> the food is the heart actually that's one of the one of the chapters in uh, the manifesto, or the, the guide that I'm working on, would be is love and food. Love that goes into the food is shared by the people. The way the people who serve the food, the way they react with the people that are eating it, makes the food better, makes the food healthier, makes the person who's eating it feel better about this, huh. and want to stay and want to keep going. It's it's real hard to uh, prepare food on site without proper health code, you know? That's one of the things we're going to address in the manifesto is uh, is uh, abiding by uh, local health codes and, and sorts so that the police have a hard time shutting us down. Well, what's been the inspiration to start it now? Because I've noticed that in a lot of the occupied territories, is what I call it, they're having a hard time organizing. They don't really know exactly what they're doing. And I kind of want to share the knowledge that we've gained here in the past two weeks we've gained so much knowledge and so much experience in doing this a day feels like a year mm -hmm. and i really want to be able to share a document that is living that they can add to their own experiences too mm -hmm. so that it's 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 for it's it's to help empower people to to start their own food committees just to start their own sustainability groups to to help movements like this what keeps you going this the love in here and the revolution and the love so, the promise of a new world and a new system. That concludes our interviews from Occupy Wall Street. I hope you enjoyed the segment and learned as much as I did as I conducted these interviews. To check out our podcast archive, suggest show topics, and advertise on the show, and to book me as a guest and or speaker, visit our website, www.fredopi.com. That's www.fredopi.com. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and be good.